Hello and welcome. I'm Cara Santa Maria, and I'm here to talk about innovations that change lives. We're going to explore the intersection between hardware and humanity, and we're doing it in a unique way. This is a show about science by scientists. So let's check out our team of hardcore nerds. Phil Torres is our real life Spider-Man. He studies insects in the rainforests of Ecuador and Peru. Our real life Spider-Man takes us to Colorado, where Iron Man comes to life, helping one woman stand tall despite a devastating disability. Coaster Grammatis is an engineer who designed a bionic eye. He takes us to Maryland to meet a young man who surprised the world by inventing a test that predicts cancer. And I'm Cara Santa Maria. I'm a science journalist and educator with a background in neurobiology. That's our team. Now let's do some science. We're back here at our favorite meeting place, having some coffee. And Phil and Costa, you guys did some incredible stories this week. I'm really interested to start out and hear about this exosuit from you, Phil. So the wheelchair was invented about 1,500 years ago. So I'm pretty sure we're due for an upgrade. And I think this might be it, guys. Check out this robot. So right here, you're seeing it's on its own. This is where it's getting tested, but there, on an actual person. Wow. I got to meet these test pilots who were putting these suits through their paces and some really amazing people. Let's take a look. Hi. Hi. I a said big me. dream happening today. These kids from a summer camp near Aspen, Colorado are about to give Amanda Boxtel a life-changing yeah. gift. Hi. It's a gift that will help her do something she hasn't been able to do here since she was paralyzed in a horrific skiing accident 21 years ago. And now I want to invite the kids to just have at it and rip into it. <laughs> it's a bionic robot called Exo, a battery-powered external skeleton that gives her legs the power to do this. Are you ready? And this. We're walking, you guys! And even this. <laughs> the technology is so cutting edge that Amanda is the first person in the United States to own one. The moment she stood up, I was just amazed because she's been sitting down for 21 years, and that first feeling to stand up again, it's just, I would have been thrilled to be in that position. It was an emotional moment for these kids, who spent the past year selling countless cups of lemonade and raising money from generous donors to make it happen. That was, like, my dream right there. All I wanted to see was her walk. It was amazing. For Amanda, it was the culmination of a dream she's had ever since she was told she'd never walk again. Probably the most um, profound moment was when I stood up and I tried to see the children's faces. And some of them, the li really little ones, they were just in awe. And then to have that heart-to-heart -heart hug. <laughs> when I hug in a wheelchair, there's a disconnect. And that's, <laughs> I get heart-to-heart -heart hugs when I stand up. <laughs> Can you promise me a standing hug later? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Amanda took her first steps towards making that dream a reality in 2010. That's when she got a call from the robot's creators, asking her to become a test pilot for their new technology. She traveled to their headquarters in the San Francisco Bay Area and took it for a test run. How did it feel to be able to stand and just look at people? First time I stood up, I went home and I cried hard, in all honesty. You know, these were emotions that I had been dreaming about for so long. And I felt so 
good in my body. I slept hard and I wasn't in pain. Total ending steps? 4,850. Oh, 4,850. So, what? nice. The technology is fast moving and they're constantly coming up with something new. That's why I love flying back to California and saying, okay, bring it on. What am I gonna try today? This is EXO's headquarters, where the magic is made and perfected. Here, robots like this are put through their paces, all to give people who are paralyzed a chance to do what they've been told was impossible. I feel like the luckiest man alive. I mean... Nathan Harding is a co-founder of ExoBionics and one of the robot's inventors. It was first developed not for the health field, but for the battlefield as a device to help soldiers carry heavy loads long distances. There's a huge problem in the U.S. military right now with soldiers getting injuries due to the large loads they're carrying, and in fact, they want to carry even more. So uh, we were helping develop exoskeletons to carry the weight of someone's backpack and the weight of their vest as well. Harding says the key breakthrough was creating a wearable robot that could support its own weight with a minimum of energy. That means it can be powered by a small battery pack. And then there's that whole walking thing. And it takes over the function of the muscles in your legs. And it can do that either completely for like a person who's completely paralyzed below the waist, or it can do it partially for someone who's maybe trying to relearn how to walk, like someone who's just had a stroke. So the only thing I have to do is initiate the first step. Like Amanda, Jason Geezer is an exo test pilot. I put the device in walk mode, and then take the first right step, and then as I move my body, the exo will move with me. But if I stop, and I don't go to the next position, the exo stops. Hmm. So then I can just move forward, and lateral, and there we go, we're walking again. In 2008, his spinal cord was injured in a motorcycle accident that almost killed him. Jason says he found out he was paralyzed in a dream he had while he was in a coma. It was his girlfriend, Karen, who delivered the news. And her message uh, said this uh, almost verbatim. Hey, baby, it's me. You were in a bad motorcycle accident, and the doctors say you'll never walk again. If this isn't the life that you want to live, we understand and we'll let you go. But if you want to stay and fight, I'll be here with you. I could hardly ever tell that story without tearing up. But I knew that I have always been a fighter. So I wasn't going to give up. EXO helped him battle to defy the odds. The first time I stood up in EXO was just ridiculous. It was amazing. Um, so many emotions are kind of going through. You have your fear of, uh, you know, I haven't stood and walked, you know, really walked, and it had been over two years. And there's excitement, like you're getting ready to, like, blast off into, you know, to space. Test pilots like Amanda Boxtel and Jason Geezer, how have they helped you guys advance this technology? Oh, they've helped immensely because everything is unpredictable once you introduce a human into the system. I remember being in the room with 13 PhDs and they all had a different idea of what would be the exact way to control something. Without people like Amanda and Jason, I mean, we'd really be at a standstill because we couldn't test anything. The first time I used the EXO, the uh, physical therapist was the only one that had control. So they would monitor my body position and take the step when they felt that my body was in a safe and uh, accurate position for walking. Right. And Daryl wouldn't walk you into a wall or anything cruel like that? He would try. <laughs> but I know he cares, because he catches me when I get off balance. <laughs> <laughs> While EXO has pushed the boundaries of what is possible, the robot still has its limitations. Right now, it can only be used in a rehabilitative setting with a trained physical therapist. Okay. You ready? I'm ready, yep. Here and then go. there's the price tag, from $110 to $140,000. Exobionics hopes the Food and Drug Administration will approve the device for home use, which could increase demand and decrease price. There's nothing about this device that should make it any more expensive than, say, a high-end motorcycle. 
and we just have to get to those kind of quantities in production and we can drive the cost down substantially and then we can make it more accessible. <laughs> you want another hug? Get a little closer. Uh -huh. <laughs> there. Oh, I don't get enough of these heart-to-heart -heart hugs. Well, if you need another hug, <laughs> I'm your man. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you. That was incredible. I mean, what a feat of engineering. Those, those were basically standalone robots that a person just like pops into, right? Yeah, when they're sitting on their own, they look like a little person sitting there, these robots. It's really kind of weird. Can you drive them? Can you like someone else remotely make them go? Well, that's actually how they start, is the, the physical therapist actually trains them by making the right leg go, the left leg go first. So that's uh -huh. the first step for them to learn how to take steps on their own. It's like when you're taking your driver's ed, yeah. and the instructor actually has their own brake pedal, Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> they got their own brake, their own wheel right yeah. there. And those kids, the kids who like work so hard to raise that money, to help her, being able to see her stand up for the first time. I loved it when they were like, we never knew how tall you were. It's like magic, really. This technology is like magic, that these kids never thought that it'd be possible. This person who they only knew as being in a wheelchair, all of a sudden can stand and walk around with this help of this robot. It's amazing. And they came out of the military, they started in the military. Does that mean that we're actually augmenting the, the people that were helping as well? Are they stronger with these? That's, that's hard to say. I will say this came from what was called the Hulk. So it was this military technology, this suit that was designed to allow soldiers to carry really heavy things and put less stress on their body. But then they saw the medical application for it. And for the scientists there, they have loved it. They say it's the best job in the world because they get to work with these paraplegic people who are the test pilots for this technology. And as you guys saw, they, I mean, they really put it through the works and they see how to make it better. And so every month they're making improvements on this thing. Can the paraplegics lift things with these legs? Not yet. Not so yet. right now it's still, it's still in the walking phase. Mm -hmm. It's teaching them how to walk again, which is a miracle in itself. Obviously the technology is amazing and quite an innovation, but the stories behind the test pilots, that's what really hits you. Check it out, guys. We've already talked about the science and technology that goes behind this, but now let's talk about the human element and the miracles in these test pilots and what they get to experience with it. I don't Hi. <laughs> Since it was first introduced, EXO has helped people who thought they'd never walk again take more than three million steps. That's the best part. Push it away. <laughs> and not just test pilots like Amanda and Jason, but patients in more than 40 hospitals and physical rehabilitation centers around the world. This one spasms a lot, and I think it's the hamstring. That I don't my, know. My hamstring, hamstring, I think it's nine? coming from your calf. Oh, but is it's it? coming from your foot. Oh, watch, you want to watch? Here we go. Oh. Some of those centers are investigating whether walking with EXO can improve the health of people who would otherwise be bound to a wheelchair. Most people don't understand is that uh, when a person gets a spinal cord injury, they typically cost the healthcare system uh, $4.6 million over their life after they have their injuries. And the reason why is they're constantly getting re-hospitalized for an array of things that, that mostly have to do with life in a wheelchair. And sometimes with my neuropathic nerve pain, which is common for individuals with spinal cord injuries, sometimes on a scale of one to 10, it's an 11. And I live with that. I live with that every day. And when I walk, it dissipates. The more frequent I walk and uh, the, the more time I'm up, I experience better digestion of my food. I experience, um, you know, better uh, you know, bowel and bladder function. While researchers study the robot's impact on health, it's clear EXO's impact on the life of a person who is paralyzed can be extraordinary. The next best thing to a miracle. For Jason Geezer, EXO meant he could walk with Karen the day he made her his wife and she walks to me and we turn and we walk down to get married together. And so it was, 
the most amazing day. I mean, you, I can't even put words to describe how important it was for that day to happen just like that. For Amanda Boxtel, it meant she could take a stroll with the ski patroller who saved her life 21 years ago. Hal Hartman was the first person at my accident site. He came to see me walk, and that was pretty special because um, <laughs> he looked at me in my eyes, standing up eye to eye, and he said, I ne never knew that you were this tall. <laughs> he said, I always, for 21 years, have imagined what it might be like to look at you standing up eye to eye. And we did that. And there it was. Wow. And we walked. <laughs> yeah. That was beautiful. I mean, wow. Wow, I don't even know what to say. The people that EXO was working with, these people, I was just blown away by each one of them. The way that they use this technology to influence their lives and the lives of the people around them. I mean, you saw the way that the guy who rescued her got to stand next to her. And, and that man walking mm. down the aisle, oh my god. It doesn't, he was able to walk at his wedding. It doesn't get any better than that. I just can't wait till they're faster than me. Like, they're, they're just gonna be running. I, just, I don't know. You I'm wanna just, be bionic so I totally bad. wanna be don't bionic. <laughs> Hosta, you got to meet a 16-year-old genius. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> This is him uh, freaking out at the Intel Science Fair when he took first place this year. He's 16, he invented a cancer screening test. Right now, pancreatic cancer and, and several other cancers are very hard to test for. They're not very accurate and they take a lot of time to do. He invented a cancer screening test that is changing everything. He's incredible and I got to spend uh, a day with him, got to go kayaking, got to see what his life was like. Let's check it out. So where, where's Jack? Where, 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 where. There he is, Jack, stand up, because that's pretty spectacular stuff. Recognized by President Obama, 16-year-old Jack Andrika may be the Thomas Edison of our time. He's been making headlines ever since winning the 2012 Intel Science Fair for his revolutionary cancer test. Well, what really motivated me to create a new way to attack pancreatic cancer was the death of a close family friend who was like an uncle to me. We're here at the home of Jack and Draca, where we'll explore the environment that nurtured his passion. He always was very persistent. You know, I think that was like an inborn characteristic of his. We just raised our kids to, you know, be curious and creative. I understand you're a competitive kayaker? Yeah, so I'm actually on the U.S. Junior Wildwater team. I started really getting into competitive kayaking in sixth grade, so. Sixth grade was kind of like me becoming ultra competitive. There was like strong sibling rivalry during science fairs. Like we would compete all the time. Ah! Oh my God! So with a lot of things, you know, they might ask questions and we're like, well, figure it out yourself. These days, Jack and Drake doesn't spend much time in high school. In fact, last year, he missed about 90% of his classes. What's he doing? He's talking to executives at biotech companies, patent lawyers, and even the president. But it was here in science class in North County High School in Glen Burnie, Maryland, where he made his revolutionary discovery. Past elementary school, my education was kind of paramount in my success. I think that was kind of where I got a lot of my competitiveness. Like, it made science fair a blood sport. It was like the Hunger Games, but for science. School ends at two, and then you have eight hours to tinker and think, and, and there's so much on the internet to learn. Using the internet, I found that 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. And so also our current method of diagnosis is this $800 test that misses 30% of all cancers and hasn't been updated in over six decades. And that's what really motivated me. And so essentially I typed up a list of like the procedure, materials list, timeline, and budget. And I sent that to 200 professors at Johns Hopkins University and the National Institutes of Health. Then eventually one person, Dr. Maitra, finally said yes. And so then I go into his lab for this big interview, and I finally get through this hour-long interview. I answered all the questions, 
and then finally I got the lab space I needed. Then when he finally got his lab, I just drove him there and I would just sit out there for hour after hour until my poor little iPod and iPhone would run out of batteries. And after seven months of like trials and tribulations, I finally got through it all and I ended up with that one small paper sensor. And so it was really exciting that one day in late winter when he came out late at night and it had worked. Jack's new method of cancer detection uses strips to test blood for high levels of mesothelin, a protein overproduced in people with pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancers. So what I do is I first get my initial reading and I record it. And then what happens is I take some of my sample and I disperse that cancer biomarker in it. I just pipette out a bit. Then I apply six microliters, and you apply it right between the two electrodes. I just continuously take this resistance measurement and it forms a graph. And at the end, I subtract the maximum minus the minimum. And then based on that difference, I can tell whether or not a patient has pancreatic cancer. And even in the early stages, I can detect it when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. 100 people die of pancreatic cancer every day, and my motivation was, how am I going to help save 100 lives today? Winning at Intel International Science and Engineering Fair was pretty much a childhood dream come true. I mean, that's kind of what got me into science. I just remember, wow, you can kind of be like a superstar with science. So ever since then, it was my dream just to go to ISAF. And when I won the entire thing, I wasn't expecting to win any award. And so it was absolutely crazy, as you can see by my reaction. <laughs> <laughs> to see your child's childhood dream come true, what could be better than that? Seeing somebody like Jack succeed at his age and sit in the booth with Michelle Obama and stuff like that, I think that will allow students to understand that it is possible, that they could do it if they wanted to. Like it's leaking through the bottom. Oh, shoot, that is not good. Just don't mind that. One of the most valuable lessons I have learned throughout this entire experience is your ideas, like typically as a young person, your ideas don't really get heard, but like as an influencer, your ideas do get heard. Jack was called the Thomas Edison of our time. I think he's very true. Uh, Jack, can you, can you share with us uh, a little bit of the backstory? I'm looking at adapting it to these different uh, diseases because what's so cool about this is it's kind of like a platform for the detection of any biological agent. And that means any disease, ranging from Alzheimer's to other forms of cancer, even HIV, AIDS, and heart disease. I actually don't think I'm a role model in like, that sense, but like, it's definitely interesting and I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> Cool kid. What, what's next for Jack? Jack is working on um, this a big X Prize, a tricorder X Prize, and, and basically what that is is uh, a, a device that can sense many different diseases all wrapped into like an iPhone size thing. Very cool. So that could change the medical landscape. Oh, totally. This kid is on it. Do you think Jack's gonna be the one to do it? Uh, he's got an amazing team of his peers, and he. But I can't even get. It's incredible. I mean, if he's done that much at 16, who knows what he'll do by 56. For sure, that kid makes me feel really lazy, no? <laughs> Let's get but, to it, guys, come on. For sure, he is a huge, huge inspiration. I am so excited to see what Jack has in store for us, and I'm really excited to get back in the field with you guys. There's some incredible medical marvels this week. Who knows what we have in store next? We'll find out. Mm -hmm. Techno's world never stops. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, and more.